Hello and welcome to the Bankers Roundtable on International Financial Centers. My name is Silvia Pavoni and I am the Investments Editor of the Bank. I am joined today by a group of senior representatives of international financial jurisdictions who are going to help me discuss the implications of the current economic and financial markets climate on leading and emerging financial centers around the world. Before we start discussions, I would like to ask my guests to introduce themselves, starting from my right. Hello, I'm Chris Cummings, Chief Executive of the City UK. Hello, my name is Sally Cap. I'm the Agent General for Victoria, representing the Government of Victoria, Australia. And I'm Janet Ecker, the President of the Toronto Financial Services Alliance in Canada. I'm Steve Bernard, the Managing Director of the Geneva Financial Centre. Uh, I'm Akshay Randeva, a Director at the Qatar Financial Centre. So the financial crisis called for a strong regulatory response, which resulted in copious volumes of new rules ranging from uh, banks' capital requirements to over-the-counter derivatives to uh, trading rules. Um, the US produced the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, Europe is developing Basel III and uh, is now discussing the possibility of introducing a financial transaction tax. Um, what are the effects of uh, these new rules on, uh, leading, uh, on, on the leading uh, financial centres of the world, which um, for the moment and for the foreseeable future remain London and New York? And perhaps, Chris, we should start with you. Thank you. Well, from a UK perspective, one of the uh, challenges that we have here is that uh, our reputation as a sector was damaged through the financial crisis. Uh, we know that the public looks to politicians to bring about a more stable regulatory system. Uh, and so politicians have uh, put pressure on regulators to respond with, uh, with more vigorous regulatory responses. Uh, from the industry's perspective, we sometimes get portrayed as the unwilling bride dragged to the altar of regulatory reform. And I think that's, that's partly a misreading of how the industry is engaged with the desire to see new regulation. Because what we realize is if we are going to get the home crowd back on side, if we're going to win back the confidence of the public here in the UK, then the public expects to see the financial services industry in discussion with the regulators in order to bring about better regulation better in the sense of more stable, but also better in the sense of a regulatory regime that encourages growth, that encourages investment, that can provide the jobs that Europe certainly needs. Uh, and so from a UK perspective, a better engagement with regulators from the industry is absolutely fundamental. But of course, uh, the, the UK is not an island. We operate within the wider European environment. Uh, and our challenge from the UK's perspective is to make sure that European regulation as it's framed gets framed with an international, a global outlook, um, but with the sense that we have to keep Europe competitive, that it's not sufficient for Europe to be competitive just within itself. It has to be internationally competitive. Otherwise, we will lose out to uh, more attractive markets, certainly in Asia. So cooperation is one of the key words at the moment. What do the other panelists think about this, Ali? It's been an interesting time for Australia because, of course, in many ways, uh, our regulatory regime has handled the financial crisis around the world uh, very well. And a lot of that means that we've been looking back to understand our capital adequacy requirements, for example, as a base have always been very tight and uh, relatively very high. And although the industry itself bridled against some of that regulation for a long time, of course, it's always a luxury with retrospect to look back and think, OK, they, they were very good, stable policies and regulations to have in place. Nonetheless, I really want to pick up on that point of cooperation and globalisation because we need to be uh, not just competitive, but able to complement and interact effectively with other uh, regions and economies uh, around the world. And so even during this time when in some ways we're reflecting on the fact that our regulation has actually held up very well comparatively, it's not a time to be complacent. It is a time to continually review and look at how we can review because there are, and, and what we can learn, there are so many lessons coming out of the, the situations around the world. Uh, and uh, all of the discussions <clears throat> and uh, debates that are happening. So to avoid complacency and look to how we can continue to improve and through that actually increase and improve our, our globalisation. And one of the very recent examples of doing that has been to look back over our superannuation system, mm -hmm. for example, which for Australia is a real driver of our financial services sector with compulsory superannuation having driven 
uh, at 9% currently, rising to 12% exponential growth in funds under management. Mm -hmm. It has created opportunities for liquidity, which is so important for financial services sectors. It's a major strategic asset for Australia, as well as being an important asset for each individual. And so as a sector, we realise that, um, and I think this is where we're at with financial services generally, it, it was a big focus on growth we've moved back to a big focus as it should be on protection mm -hmm. and how do we set ourselves up to make sure that we've got those fundamentals right for protection because from that we can actually support growth uh, more effectively than being focused at the growth end which I must say was a lot of the debate pre-financial sure. crisis within our financial services sector in Australia. And so finding the right balance uh, as you said right now between balance. supporting growth and, uh, and keeping the market safe is, yeah. uh, is the, the key, <laughs> the yeah. key element. Um, and John, you represent uh, a country and a jurisdiction that did particularly well during the financial crisis. Uh, so I wonder what is your take on, on uh, the current issues and uh, uh, how do you think Canada will uh, keep on scoring in the future? I presume you're going to say really well, but, but let's see. <laughs> well, first of all, no one's taking anything for granted mm -hmm. in the current environment. I think everybody has to uh, be on their game because uh, we're not sure where some of it is all going to end up. But you're right, Sylvia, that Canada's uh, financial services system came through the, the, uh, the turmoil relatively unscathed. Um, people used to like to um, make jokes about our uh, banking system as being sort of too stodgy and too conservative and as our federal finance minister likes to say now, stodgy is the new sexy. <laughs> um, so you know we didn't have to bail anybody out um, and we've still got, I mean our regulatory system uh, uh, is very stable. We also think the model that we have there is sustainable um, and again um, you know the macroeconomic figures are are good and, and the countries again you know we're, we're not taking anything for granted but I think one of the concerns that we do have is you know Chris made a good point we are global I mean it, it um, and one of the things that marks all of us as global centers is that interconnectedness and our, our companies do business with everybody else uh, and we need to make sure that we have that fluidity and that ease of doing business and I think one of the concerns that Canada has had is that um, it's the old law of unintended consequences. There's this great, and I used to, uh, when I was a finance minister, used to like to joke that the uh, uh, there's nothing more dangerous than a government determined to do something, and we have an entire globe's worth of governments determined to to do more regulation. And while we all recognize, and certainly our industry, um, we've got a very strong relationship between uh, our regulator, our government policymakers, and our financial system, and there's a lot of interchange and conversation back and forth, which I think you know gives you effective regulation gives you the kind of regulation that solves the problems gives you the transparency and accountability you want but doesn't sort of kill the goose that lays the golden egg because our financial system in every economy um, is a driver of economic growth um, and you and we can see what happens when your financial system does get out of whack and the uh, the culture within our our financial system has been very much uh, you know not how close to the line can we get mm -hmm. but um, okay here's what the regulator says here's what our policy says so that clearly setting uh, establishing sort of rainy day funds mm -hmm. to use the phrase um, at a much higher level so there has been a different approach to that and we're quite concerned that um, some of the rules and regulations that are you know being debated one or not not going to solve the problems. Two, they're going to penalize the uh, the systems that have had a good system and are working well together. Um, it, it, these are all highly interesting points and uh, we, we are discussing just after the IMF World Bank meetings have uh, come to an end uh, where clearly one of the main topics was discussing uh, uh, financial market stability and oversight on financial market institutions and uh, what you're saying is, is um, of course still uh, very important and hopefully it's going to be um, addressed in the appropriate way. Um, Steve, I was wondering what is your take and you represent Switzerland which is a jurisdiction that um, um, uh, is very strong on financial uh, services of course uh, and has been benefiting some say um, in a way from um, the potential uh, um, uh, um, let's say lack of attractiveness that some of the other financial centres around the world might suffer in terms of uh, some asset managers come in, come in over and, and stay with you. So um, what is Switzerland's take on, Switzerland's takes on, on what's happening at the moment? Well, well two points. Uh, 
regarding the safe haven aspect of Switzerland, it's true we have benefited, if I may say, of uh, this global turmoil that we're all um, traveling through, and hopefully we, we, we hope to see the end of the tunnel, but we, no one around the table knows when all this uh, uncertainty will end. So Switzerland's image uh, and reputation and excellence in uh, asset preservation uh, because of its safe haven image has mm -hmm. been enhanced or reinforced. That's one thing. But on the other hand, when your neighbors are potentially at risk, you cannot relax. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you must be aware that you're part of um, the European continent and uh, we not at all, we don't feel schadenfreude, you know, a German mm -hmm. word which says that we're not uh, taking advantage and we're not uh, particularly happy because it also has indirect consequences for our country. Think of the Swiss franc. The Swiss franc has risen to levels which even the Swiss National Bank uh, chairman has described as absurd. Now regarding the regulation side, which, uh, which you mentioned earlier and which my colleagues have also uh, evoked, uh, from the Swiss perspective, I'm not sure it's much different because we obviously we want, if you, it's almost uh, the, to catch all, all uh, how do you say, all objectives at the same time. We want to protect the customer, the investor, we want to protect the creditors, we want to uh, protect the country from systemically relevant banks, and we have two strong institutions in the country which can be systemic risk mm -hmm. for the country, hence a special regulation for them. Mm -hmm. And we also are concerned about the reputation risk. So uh, clearly Switzerland is very much concerned with, uh, with the banking system as well as, as the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. Um, hosting two uh, very big um, banks, Credit Suisse and UBS, uh, who represent a high multiple of, uh, of the country's GDP. So high multiple, but which has, which has been reduced lately because the uh, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland had also those kind of multiples, mm -hmm. and the balance sheets of those banks have been significantly reduced. So there's an effort by the banks, and there is an also an effort by the government, the Swiss National Bank, mm -hmm. also to work on special buffers, on liquidity requirements, on uh, what we call the Swiss finish that goes beyond Basel III, with uh, the so-called uh, convertible uh, contingents and uh, equity. So we're talking about 19% equity, so which is um, in the high range, but because we have higher requirements, we want those banks to be sure and to be protected. The Swiss taxpayer must be protected in case those banks run into difficulties, mm -hmm. which we do not envisage at all right now because the business model has moved quite long significantly over the last three years. Okay, thank you. Ashka, you came all the way from Qatar, uh, uh, which is uh, a growing financial center. It has been investing quite heavily in its financial infrastructure, and I know that uh, one of the key objectives is also to um, attract a specific part of the financial world, which is um, the, the asset management uh, world. Uh, what is your take um, on what is happening uh, around the world in, the, in terms of stronger regulation and, uh, uh, and uh, what financial centers ought to do to uh, try to contain systemic risk? Well, uh, I guess you've got to start from considering that the backdrop in Qatar is uh, a, a little different. You, you talked mm -hmm. about a country that in 2011 is growing at 20% after a 16% growth rate in 2010. In a region that's growing at about 4.5-5% if you look at the MENA region. Uh, in a world that's growing at about 1.5 odd percent. Uh, and that definitely has an impact. So when, when you're talking about the regulators, this as a developing uh, country, which is still building the financial services infrastructure uh, and is thinking about uh, how we should look at various aspects mm -hmm. uh, of the financial services sector. And uh, though the uncertainty and the volatility in the world uh, currently is definitely not helping uh, almost anybody in the world, but we, we've, we are having a lot of very interesting conversations around the world. And the fact that uh, you are living in, in a very interconnected world. As, as it's, it's almost a common stream in all of our uh, conversations so far. Uh, th th that has a certain impact, and we are realizing the importance to of being responsive and being structured in a way that you can work well with the rest of the world. And in this period of volatility, volatility, have a very coordinated response because there's nothing that can impact industry more than uh, the lack of uh, a coordinated response. And 
the uncertainty that automatically creates in regulation. Mm -hmm. And that's a mm -hmm. certain thing which even looking a little bit from the outside, if you may, uh, is of a concern. Sure. And I see everybody's nodding here on the, on the, on the, the importance of uh, strong cooperation. Are we, are we seeing this? Well, you, need, you, you need cooperation, uh, you know, as I said earlier, between your regulator, your, your policymakers, and your industry because financial services is highly complex. And no matter how good a regulator or a government is, they're never going to be as in tune with what's happening um, on the street, as it were. Equally, the industry is never going to understand as completely what the, the, the macro comprehensive systemic challenges are that regulators and policymakers are trying to deal with. So what you need is that very strong interchange. Mm -hmm. And what um, we're very concerned about is that that in some, in some areas has been, uh, in some countries, and that is there's more friction there and, and there's, there's, a, there's an attempt to want to be punitive as opposed to what's really the problem, how do we really mm -hmm. solve it. And in these countries are the ones that have got their fingers burned most. Uh, and you can understand yeah. the, the, the impetus for wanting to do that, but actually it's quite right. The interconnectedness means one of two things. You're either going to get some countries that are going to do uh, tougher or different kinds of rules and regulations that are going to drive uh, business underground mm -hmm. or they're going to drive companies to other jurisdictions. So we're going to get regulatory arbitrage. Or secondly, we're going to have global rules that are going to damage those systems that through their business culture, through their, their regulation, through their business uh, models, you know, like Canada, for example, didn't have some of those issues and, and, and are, are believe that if we continue to stick to our knitting, won't have as we go down the road. No, the, I was going to uh, reflect on, um, we had a moment of clarity, a uh, global consensus of 2007 and eight, where actually the G20, the world came together to agree global, uh, a global way forward. Um, I think the challenge that we face since then has been an increasing desire to repatriate regulation. Mm. Uh, and certainly we see that happening in, in North America. I think we're guilty of it here in, in Europe. Um, uh, and certainly looking around at other parts of the world as well, individual uh, initiatives mm -hmm. threaten that, that global consensus. Mm. The downside of that, of course, for business is that business isn't quite sure will the, will the global consensus re-emerge? Uh, and the, the great danger is that indeed we, we do head back towards a degree of arbitrage, which isn't um, in anybody's interests, mm -hmm. certainly not in, in business interests. How serious do you think the risk of arbitrage is? Um, I, I think it, a lot depends on what happens over the next few months. Um, you know, we, we always look towards the US in terms of what's happening with Dodd-Frank to see how, how that's going to be implemented. I think the discussions we're having here in, in Europe around financial transaction tax, mm -hmm. uh, we're mapping Basel against the CRD, um, but of course it's not just CRD, it's solvency. So we'll, how will solvency two play out with CRD four? Which is for, for, uh, for the, affects the insurance sector. It, um, it, it does, but actually, of course, businesses are no longer rigid into silos. I'm a bank, I'm an insurance company, I'm an asset manager. What, what we find is that a, a business is affected by all of these. Yeah. Um, and yet, one of the challenges from a business perspective is to, uh, is to help our regulators understand, our politicians understand, that the world doesn't conform to neat little pigeonholes. I'm sure it used to do at one point. And so what we have to do, of course, is provide what some politicians like to call the real economy uh, with a viewpoint. So having Lufthansa explain why hedging is essential to keeping its aeroplanes in the sky is far more important than uh, a market participant uh, in, in the language explaining that point of view. So we find business, SMEs and the public mm -hmm are much better advocates of financial services than financial services can be at the moment. We need to help them be those advocates. Well, and, and I think I think that uh, one of the things that uh, I remember when I was meeting with some of your colleagues many months ago when City UK was sort of restructuring, setting itself up as City UK, and part of the mandate that I was very impressed with was where it, it also talked about communicating about, the, and I'm not going to articulate it correctly, but the value of, of financial services to the broader economy. Um, and we've had uh, our the province of Ontario where where, where uh, Toronto is located, we're just in the middle of a provincial election campaign, very hotly contested. And what was really interesting, certainly in my lifetime, I'd never seen this before, we had what we call an all-candidates debate, so representatives of all the parties were there, and they were all talking about supporting 
financial services as an industry, as a job generator, that they recognized, you know, the high quality of the jobs, um, you know, that and, and that I think um, watching all three parties not sort of go after each other to compete on it, but to say, yes, we all understand that this is a sector we need to support and nurture, not, not to let them get away with things. I mean, that's not what anybody's saying. But you have to pay attention to the growth, uh, the sustainable kind of growth. So there is, an, I think, an obligation upon the industry's point, uh, on the industry side, to pay attention to um, the public uh, as well, because that's how you work with government to get good, uh, good regulation. Mm -hmm.